Hi, everybody. Uh, so today and this week, we are going to be talking about politics during the Gilded Age. Uh, we've already covered a little bit about this uh, in our week about industrialization and when we talked a little bit about uh, the you know, co connection between business and politics during the late 19th century, but we're kind of going to delve a little bit more into it now today. And we're going to examine uh, a particular political movement that was really interesting in the late 19th century, and that's the movement of populism. Uh, so we'll be looking at that uh, primarily today. So the big questions that we're looking at today is what were the effects of urban growth in the Gilded Age? Uh, what problems did urbanization create? Uh, we'll be looking at how the nature of politics during the Gilded Age contributed to a lot of political corruption and stalemate. And we'll examine why the money supply, of all things, became a major issue during this era, especially for farmers and how this issue impacted American politics, because that was really the issue that was uh, that the populist movement was centered around. Uh, it was centered around the issue of what kind of currency the United States would have uh, and, you know, who would be in control of the nation's financial system. So to talk a little bit, to start us off, we're going to talk a little bit about urbanization. And this is one of the things that we start really to see in the late 19th century is the development of cities uh, and growing city populations. And historians like to say that there are push and pull factors involved in the history of growing city populations in the late 19th century. So there are a variety of factors that pushed people out of their old homes and into cities, uh, but cities also pulled people to them for a variety of reasons. So some of the push factors uh, would be that uh, farm prices were you know, sort of uh, farm prices were dropping during this era. Uh, so many people could no longer make a living as a farmer. Uh, so they had to, you know, kind of go and seek work elsewhere. Uh, there were uh, also, we start to see a lot of, you know, immigration uh, during this era. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a minute. Um, the pull factors, obviously cities had a lot of, industrialization. They were the location where most of these factories and, you know, sort of other areas were located. Uh, there were, uh, cities were dynamic places. So there was a kind of a cultural, uh, you know, sort of reason why people came to cities and why people would be drawn to them. Uh, so all of these factors resulted in explosive urban growth during the late 19th century. Uh, the sources of these growth of this growth came from both uh, immigration, but also movement from the American countryside as well. As I mentioned, a lot of people are leaving their farms and they're coming to cities to to live. And so by 1900, there are six American cities that are over 500,000 people. Uh, three of those, New York and Chicago and Philadelphia, had more than a million people in population. And by 1900, New York, in fact, had more than two million people. Uh, so we start to see this explosion of urbanization in the late 19th century. Most of the new city dwellers, as I mentioned, some of them came from the farmland, but most of these new city dwellers came from abroad, uh, primarily from Europe. Between 1877 and 1890, more than 6.3 million people entered the United States. Uh, and in 1890, 15 percent of the total U.S. population was actually foreign born. By 1900, most urban dwellers uh, were the for were either foreign born or they were the children of immigrants. So we start to see, you know, this massive explosion in immigration, and it is fueling this development of these urban centers. There are all kinds of different factors uh, that are pushing millions of people to come to America in the late 19th century. We have things like unemployment in Europe, uh, food shortages, uh, increasing threats of war or persecution. Industrialization is also a big factor that not only pushes immigrants off of their farms in Europe and drives them to immigrate to America, but we also see it as being a pull factor as well. The rapid industrial expansion in the United States was also a big draw. There was this promise of jobs and economic security. And so it's not as though 
immigrants arrived completely cut off from all of their support systems. That's kind of the stereotype that we have, you know, sort of the poor uh, immigrant family who comes here and they know no one and they have to somehow survive. Often, Immigrants actually already knew someone in the United States, either a friend or a relative. Sometimes families would come over in stages, with the father arriving first to make money and then sending for his wife and children. Uh, so there was, to use a kind of a term in modern parlance, a lot of chain migration going on. Uh, and one of the things that tends also to get glossed over in standard histories of immigration to the United States is that it's not a one-way street. Very frequently, immigrants would come to America, work for several years, and then return, go back to their native country, either because they couldn't make it here or more often because that was their original plan. They were coming here to make money and then take it back to their homeland. So the history of immigration to the U.S. is more complex than what most people think when they picture those huddled masses. Uh, most of the newcomers were coming, they were seeking jobs. Uh, majority of uh, these immigrants were men between the ages of 15 and 40. Most of them were unskilled laborers, and they settled primarily on the East Coast. Uh, many of them entered through the famous port of entry, which was Ellis Island. Uh, those who had enough money to sail first or second class, they didn't have to go through Ellis Island. Uh, they got an exam on board the ship. Someone came and you know, took their information on board the ship, and then they went ashore. But the vast majority who were traveling in third class or steerage had to face a grueling inspection process. And there was a lot of fear that they might be sent back home. Uh, so they had to face a, you know, a huge amount of scrutiny from officials who were looking for uh, health problems, any sign of weakness, heart problems, or you know, if you uh, didn't, if you didn't have, you know, sort of full use of all of your limbs. Uh, they would check for disabilities or contagious diseases. If anything seemed wrong, you might be marked for further inspection. And this was a very invasive process. They would pull your eyelids back to check for uh, a bacterial infection that might lead to blindness. They would look, uh, they would scrutinize women in particular uh, for evidence of so-called loose character. Um, and finally, once you kind of pass through all of those grueling health inspections, you would reach the desk of a clerk who would ask you things like your name, your age, your occupation. And the clerk was the one to ultimately kind of decide the fate of these newcomers. Uh, for most immigrants, the process took about five hours, but other people ended up spending days just waiting to see if they would be let into the United States. Despite this very harsh process and all the rumors that kind of, you know, went around about, you know, how difficult it was, uh, no more than 3% per year were actually turned away. Uh, so the vast majority of immigrants eventually made it to the United States. And they settled in areas where other people of their nationality or their religion lived. Beginning in the 1880s, what we see is that the sources of immigration start to shift. They shift dramatically away from Northern and Western Europe. So we start to see more and more people coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, and you can see that here in this chart. The blue line represents the immigration from Northern and Western Europe. And you can see in the 1880s, it starts to drop pretty dramatically. And it goes back up for a little bit, but then it comes, it's, you know, on a steady downward trend. Whereas the red line there, you can see in the 1880s, it starts to rise. Uh, and you see, you know, sort of a kind of general upward trend. Uh, approximately... Uh, Eight and a half million or so uh, people came from Southern and Eastern Europe uh, between 1880 and 1910. And these are places like Italy, uh, Greece, Austria, uh, Poland, Russia. Most of these new immigrants tended to be Catholics or Jews rather than Protestants. Uh, many of them were very unskilled. Uh, they spoke, uh, you know, they spoke very little English, if at all. Uh, they were poor and uneducated, and they generally tended to stick together in these, you know, very close knit communities. Uh, they tended to, you know, sort of try to at all, you know, if if they could preserve their native customs, their languages, their religions. Uh, so. Immigrants 
ended up being kind of crowded together in uh, tenement slums in the inner cities. And the living conditions in these tenement slums, as you can see from these photographs, were really, really problematic. Uh, the 10th Ward, uh, which is a location on lo New York's Lower East Side, had a population density of 747 people per acre. Um, and it was probably the most crowded spot in the world in 1900. Uh, some of its blocks housed nearly 3,000 people. So these are crowded places. Uh, and people are living in these very tiny cramped apartments. Sometimes a whole family might live in a single tiny room, as you can see here. Uh, somewhere between four and 16 families might live on a single floor. And there might be only two restrooms for the entire floor. Uh, there was very little air or ventilation. These places were notorious fire traps. The rooms were actually so dark that they could not be photographed until after flash photography was invented in 1887. So nobody sort of really knew what these tenements looked like until after the technology was invented to actually illuminate them so you could see. These cities were at least these kind of, you know, tenement areas of the cities were very, very unpleasant places. They smelled really, really bad. Uh, there was still, of course, a lot of horses on the streets, so there was horse manure everywhere. Uh, there were no sewer systems. There was no clean drinking water. There was a lot of factory pollution. And these inner city tenements were breeding grounds, uh, as you might imagine, for crime as well. When you, cry, when you cram so many people in one place together, you're bound to get conflict and tension and, and crime happening. The national homicide rate triples in the 1880s. Uh, there are a lot of street gangs that develop. Uh, the suicide rate rose dramatically. Uh, there was a problem of alcoholism. And it wasn't as though these immigrants were crowding together necessarily by choice. Um, it was necessarily by, it was by necessity. Uh, they didn't really have anywhere else that they could go. This was the only place that they could afford to live. And so these tenements became, you know, quickly became very uh, problematic places. And they became sources of anti-immigrant sentiment that we start to see. These new immigrants uh, were widely described by native-born uh, Americans as members of distinct and supposedly inferior races, uh, whose lower level of civilization was, was explained or explained all kinds of social problems. Everything from the fact that immigrants were willing to work for substandard wages to their supposed inborn tendency toward criminal behavior. And so we see in the late 19th century this resurgence of nativism. This is something that we've seen periodically throughout American history. We see waves of anti-immigrant sentiment. And this era saw the nativist streak cresting once again. So in 1891, a group of Boston professionals founded the Immigration Restriction League. And this organization called for reducing immigration by barring illiterate people uh, from entering the United States. And this measure was adopted, actually adopted in Congress uh, early in 1897, but the president ended up vetoing it. States throughout the country also were experimenting with ways to eliminate uh, undesirable people from voting. Um, it was thought, you know, sort of if you're illiterate, then you can't vote, you can't, you know, sort of participate in the political process. Um, nearly all states during the 1890s adopted the secret ballot, uh, which was meant to both protect voters' privacy, but also to limit the participation of people who were illiterate, uh, who could no longer receive help from party officials at polling places. Uh, so we start to see the kind of boundaries of nationhood, the idea of who can be an American. These ideas are contracting during this era. And you see leaders of both political parties expressing particularly vicious opinions regarding Chinese immigrants. They become, you know, sort of a, a particular target uh, of hatred. Uh, beginning in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, Congress temporarily banned all immigrants from China from entering the country. Uh, and 
This was the first time that actually they had used race to exclude an entire group of people. Uh, Non-whites, of course, had uh, long been barred from being naturalized citizens. Uh, but this was the first time they had, Congress had actually passed a law saying, no, we don't want this group, this particular group of people coming here. Uh, Congress renewed the restriction 10 years later and actually made it permanent in 1902. Chinese people in the U.S. were required to register with the government. Uh, they were requ required to carry immigration papers or they would be, uh, they would be facing deportation. Uh, in fact, the use of photographs for personal identification first came into widespread use as a means of enforcing the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, so people actually started using photographs for identification uh, because it was a way to, you know, sort of say, hey, you know, Hey, you're, you know, it was a way to easily determine, hey, you're Chinese, that might mean you're a suspect and might be, you know, sort of just might deport you. And this was something that was particularly prevalent on the West Coast. Uh, the Chinese suffered very intense discrimination and periodic violence against them. Uh, thousands of Chinese immigrants were expelled from towns and mining camps and mobs assaulted Chinese res residents and businesses like the one you can see here on the right. Uh, this is a picture of a store run by a Chinese American merchant uh, that has been attacked um, and been you know, attacked with, uh, by a, a mob violence. Between 1871 and 1885, the city of San Francisco uh, provided no public education for Chinese children. And when the state Supreme Court said, no, you have to allow Chinese students to attend public schools, the state legislature responded with a law, passing a law that authorized segregated education. So we see, you know, sort of not just segregation developing in the South, as we've talked about last week, but also segregation as being a way to enforce this kind of anti-immigrant sentiment in other states uh, beyond the South. The U.S. Supreme Court also considered the legal status of Chinese Americans. Uh, in the case of United States versus Wong Kim Ark, which was decided in 1898, the court ruled that the 14th Amendment awarded citizenship to the children of Chinese immigrants who were born on American soil. Um, and so this established the very important principle of birthright citizenship, the, the principle that if you are born here, that makes you automatically an American citizen. But the court also affirmed the right of Congress to set racial restrictions on immigration. And in another decision, the court authorized the federal government to expel Chinese immigrants without due process of law. So we see this kind of anti-immigrant nativist sentiment really on the rise in politics in the late 19th century. Many proponents of nativism try to use science to prove their point. Uh, the idea that some people are somehow naturally superior and others are inferior, this was not a new idea in the late 19th century. It had been around for a very long time, but now proponents of this very old idea thought that they could use modern science to explain the deep disparities that seem to be evident in American society. So this was the rise of a, a philosophy known as social Darwinism. Uh, Charles Darwin's ideas on evolution, which were first published in 1859, were becoming very influential in the late 19th century. And when he published his views on human evolution in 1871 uh, with his book, The Descent of Man, he argued, Darwin argued in that book, that there were no clear distinctions between people and that every human being shared similar mental and physical characteristics and they had a common origin. But he was also obviously a man of his time. He contrasted the so-called civilized races of man with the so-called savage races. And he thought it was likely that the savage races would be wiped out due to colonial expansion. Others ended up taking Darwin's general concept of natural selection and applying it to society. Uh, so social Darwinism was the application of these ideas of kind of natural selection uh, proposed by Darwin uh, and applying it to society. It's really a misapplication of Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, it's the idea that some people, that evolution occurs naturally in society and that some people are superior and destined to thrive and others are inferior and destined to die out. 
And this becomes associated with the phrase survival of the fittest. Darwin never actually utters the the, the phrase survival of the fittest in, in, uh, in his origin of species. That's never in there. Uh, that was a phrase that was developed later by these people who were arguing uh, about social Darwinism. One of the leading proponents of social Darwinism was this guy here. His name was William Graham Sumner. Um, and Sumner was a Yale professor. He published a book in 1883 entitled What Social Classes Owe to Each Other. And according to a lot of social Darwinists, like Sumner, if you were poor, that was your own fault. Uh, and some tried to make distinctions between these so-called deserving poor, people who were poor because they were widows or orphans, they, you know, it was no fault of their own, just their circumstance, and the so-called undeserving poor, which was basically all other poor people. Um, basically, they argued that the inequalities that they were seeing manifested in society, that they were inevitable. And that it was actually a good thing because if you let the strong survive, the weak would perish and then society would be better as a result. So this is how, you know, you start to see these ideas, uh, these racial ideas become uh, justified by this pseudo-scientific idea of social Darwinism during this era. Now that kind of brings us to looking at politics itself in the late 19th century. Um, you've probably heard a lot of people talking in recent years about how deeply, deeply divided Americans are today over all kinds of things, economics, cultural, ethical issues. There's a lot of talk about red states and blue states. The nation is you know, pretty equally divided between Republicans and Democrats. This is not a, you know, phenomenon that's unique to our own time. Back in the 1880s and 1890s, the country was just as deeply divided. In the late 19th century, Americans are primarily divided over how this new industrial capitalist system was going to work. Um, and this was a period of transition, of flux. Uh, and the economic dominance by industrial and corporate America, this wasn't necessarily a given inevitability. Many people thought that they had a better vision for the country, and we're going to see how that plays itself out in the politics of the era. So politics during the late 19th century was a lot more popular than it is now. A lot of people today, they like to say, oh, you know, I don't follow politics. I tune it out. And, you know, they're, they're just, you know, sort of people arguing against each other. For late 19th century Americans, politics was the premier form of entertainment. It was the major sport. Uh, political campaigns were followed very closely by everyone, uh, even though the bulk of the American population couldn't actually vote at the time. Uh, white males, of course, made up the majority of the electorate. Women only had the vote in a few Western states at this point. Uh, black men, as we've seen last week, were largely denied the vote in the South by various measures, poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses. Uh, and so we see that the, what, the electorate is mainly white and male. Party loyalties were especially strong in the late 19th century. Uh, unlike today when many Americans uh, consider themselves independents, they don't want to affiliate with either political party, there were relatively few independents in the late 19th century. So the electorate was divided almost equally between Republicans and Democrats. The Democrats, of course, after the Civil War, they revived their party fairly quickly, uh, and they believed in the principles of states' rights. Uh, they supported a less strong federal government. They wanted, you know, kind of limited government, decentralization. Uh, they wanted, you know, sort of the states to kind of be preeminent. Republicans, on the other hand, in the late 19th century, they were more in favor of a stronger federal government. They thought that government could be kind of an agent of progress and uh, could sort of fuel the American economy. So they passed a lot of legislation during this era to help business, uh, to encourage economic growth, uh, and also to protect civil rights, uh, as we've seen. Now, if you follow politics today, the, two, the positions of the two parties in the late 19th century might seem a little surprising. Uh, in terms of at least the issue of economics and the government's role in managing the economy and the government's role in kind of, you know, regulating society, 
the Republicans and Democrats have literally switched sides on that issue. Uh, and if you look at this electoral map, which shows how the nation voted between 1876 to 1890, we can see that this division plays out geographically. Democrats have firm control of the South, the states of the former Confederacy, and Republicans have firm control in the Northeast. A lot of the West uh, in this point, at this point couldn't vote because this land was still considered territories of the U.S. They hadn't been made into states yet. Uh, but you can see, uh, you know, sort of that there were some similarities to politics today. Uh, each party has their safe regions of the country. Uh, Dem Republicans are consistently winning in the Northeast. Uh, Democrats are consistently winning in the South. So control of the federal government rests with a handful of these irregular, doubtful states. We might call them swing states today. Uh, you've got, you know, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Indiana, California, uh, Nevada. These two parties were very evenly matched, uh, and the elections at this time were very close. Now, if we contrast the late 19th century electoral map with a map showing the presidential election in 2016, we can see that there are some similarities, but also some differences. The country seems almost e evenly divided today, population-wise, as it was back in the late 19th century. And we can see how party control in terms of geography has flipped. Now it's Democrats who are the ones controlling most of the Northeast states and the Western states and Republicans have a, their stronghold in the Midwest and the South. And I think this is really interesting to compare and contrast how the parties have kind of evolved and switched sides, not just, you know, sort of ideologically, but also geographically as well. Um, and we'll explore, we'll be exploring how that happens over the course of the 20th century. So politics in the late 19th century uh, was really dominated in, in a lot of places by local uh, political organizations. And urban political machines were a very big part of big city life in the late 19th and early 20th century. And they were very intimately tied to the city's different ethnic groups, different groups of immigrate, immigrant communities. As the cities grew, more social services were needed. And so political party machines were the or the unit or the organization that would step in and provide those services. Uh, these machines were headed by powerful bosses. And essentially what they would do was trade services for votes. Cities were divided into wards and precincts, and each was headed by their local captain. And the captain looked after his constituents, the people who were living in that particular ward or precinct. And so... You have, you know, kind of these these political machines uh, basically saying, if you vote for us, we will provide you with, you know, some of the so kind of social services that you need. The federal government or the state governments are not providing them. Uh, so the urban political machines kind of stepped up and did so. Some of these bosses were notoriously corrupt. Uh, the most famous of these was William Tweed of New York City. And uh, Tweed, you can see in this cartoon here, uh, this is a cartoon from the time, Tweed is the big fat guy over here. He was always depicted as this giant, like, you know, sort of roly-poly kind of individual. He basically ran an operation that built the city of New York out of tens of millions of dollars. Uh, other bosses believed in what they called honest graft, um, which was basically, you know, if you had, you know, you learned about a city project that wanted to be done, you know, say they were going to put street lights in on this one particular street, and you, you know, would give that, um, you would let, you know, sort of your, you know, friend or your cousin or your, you know, sort of brother who owned a, you know, street lamp company uh, that know that, you know, hey, you can go and, um, you know, sort of bid for this contract and, you know, I'll make sure that you get the winning bid. So there was a lot of this, you know, sort of uh, you scratch, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine kind of thing going on. Why did these bosses, who many of whom were openly corrupt, why did they stay in power for so long? 
Well, there are a couple of main reasons for this. Uh, they were a very skillful political organization. They ran their businesses very efficiently. Uh, the immigrants were the ones who were made up the boss's constituency. Um, and most of these immigrants were very easy prey for these well-oiled political machines. Very often you would, you know, sort of see the representatives from these, you know, kind of these different party bosses, uh, you know, meeting the immigrants as they would come off the boat uh, or come off the, you know, sort of ship uh, from Ellis Island. And they would say, hey, you know, come with me. Uh, I will give you this and that and the other. And, you know, sort of just you pledge your vote to us here. So the immigrants, you know, they were kind of easy prey, but they also were helped by the bosses. The bosses were the ones who were paying attention to the needs of the immigrant working class and poor. If you needed a job, they would find you one. If your husband died or was injured, they would collect food and clothing for you and your family. The bosses provided things like free coal to heat tenement apartments, picnics, for children, contributions to hospitals and orphanages, and they were the only ones who were offering these sort of services. Neither government nor business was, you know, stepping up to the plate at this point. Most of these bosses became wealthy, um, and they, they became very wealthy in some cases, uh, and they were taking for themselves at the same time they were giving to the poor. So these were not, you know, sort of Robin Hoods. Uh, they were not, you know, kind of robbing the rich to feed the poor and not, not getting anything out of it themselves. Reformers occasionally succeeded in getting them out, um, but these reformers rarely ended up staying in power for very long because they are not able to, you know, provide for the needs of the poor, provide for the actual constituency. Most bosses actually helped to improve the conditions in cities, and they did provide a lot of needed help for the immigrants who were living there. Now, so this kind of brings us to talking about the main subject for today, which is the subject of the political movement known as populism. Thus far, we've been discussing how America is changing very rapidly in the late 19th century. It's becoming a modern industrial nation. And all of those changes had consequences. And some of those consequences, as we've seen, were pretty negative. You have labor unrest. You have this growing wealth inequality gap between the rich and the poor. You have overcrowding and crime in the cities. You have the destruction of the Native American way of life, as we talked about last week. These negative consequences really prompts some Americans to start to ask really fundamental questions about where is their country headed and what does freedom really mean in this new age? So all of this seems to come to a head in the 1890s, which is what we're going to talk about now. So we're going to talk about the movement known as populism. And there have been a number of political movements and political controversies throughout American history. But Maybe none of them are as more secure, more obscure and hard for us to relate to or understand today than this debate that went on in the 1890s over the nation's money supply. This was the major issue of the time, and it seems kind of odd and esoteric to us when we look at it from a modern viewpoint. It's a very boring topic, right? Uh, why did so many ordinary Americans, beyond simply the bankers and the businessmen that we might expect, why did they care so much about what seems like a very trivial and incomprehensible topic as the nation's fiscal system and monetary policy? Well, if we look at it, maybe a little closer, maybe it's not all that hard to understand once we try to relate it to our own society. Today, as we've talked about, things don't seem all that different economically from the 1890s, when there are these very deep economic problems that are threatening the livelihoods of many Americans. So fiscal issues and monetary policy, whether we should bail out struggling industries or banks, what we should do about the national debt, what we should do about economic inequality, these are things that are dominating the headlines currently. And it's not all that different from what was, you know, sort of dominating the politics of the 1890s. The big questions are still the same. How should our nation's economy be regulated? How big of a role should the federal government play? What should be done, if anything, about economic inequality and this gap between the rich and the poor? Can you be truly free without economic equality? <laughs> 
Now, it's also important to remember that the issues of the 1890s had very real human consequences. Even though, you know, fiscal and monetary policy seems to be a very dry issue, it mattered whether the nation operated on a gold standard or a kind of combination standard of gold and silver, because the outcome was going to be different in each case, and it's going to have very different results for ordinary Americans. So part of the passion that many felt over this issue can be understood when we remember that this was an issue that touched upon the very survival of many Americans at the time. All right, so let's get into it. Let's talk about what all of this controversy was about and why the populist movement arose. So the issue was the nation's money supply had not grown with the expanding economy and population. The amount of money in circulation between 1865 and 1890 had actually decreased. And this, of course, raised the cost of borrowing. It made it harder for people to get loans. It led to higher interest rates. People who had to borrow money, this, this was fine for people who already had money, but people who had to borrow money, people like farmers, ranchers, the working class, they did not like this policy of decreasing the money that was in circulation. They wanted more money to be printed, and they wanted increased coinage of silver in particular. In 1873, the Republican-controlled Congress had put the United States on the gold standard. Only gold could be used for coins. Gold was the thing backing up the American economy. Silver mine operators and people who kind of speculated in currency, they were not happy about this. And they, uh, you know, were unhappy that the U.S. was on a gold standard. And they brought pressure upon Congress to make the Treasury buy unlimited amounts of silver. And this was a demand that they christened as free silver at a price that was higher than the world market at the time, which was 16 to 1. So this slogan, free silver at 16 to 1, therefore meant that the Treasury should be obliged by law to purchase unlimited amounts of silver at a rate of 16 ounces of silver for one ounce of gold. Congress ends up kind of bowing somewhat to the pressure, and they order the Treasury to purchase limited amounts of silver, but they don't accept the demand for free or unlimited purchases of silver. Now, it's easy to see, of course, why silver mine operators would want free silver, but why did a large number of Americans take up this cause? Well, what we see is that, generally speaking, uh, we are seeing kind of a period in the late, the American economy in the late 19th century is going through these repeated cycles of boom and bust. Congress, as we talked about, begins to squeeze the money supply. They begin to decrease the money supply at a time of rapid expansion of the economy. And this results in periodic panics followed by very serious depressions in which farmers can't sell their crops, businessmen close their stores, laborers end up losing their jobs. Many government officials and economists at the time, they said, oh, well, this is just a natural part of the business cycle. This is always going to happen. You know, the only remedy for this is, you know, just let it sort of play itself out. Be patient. And many people believe that any attempt by the government to restore prosperity would only make things worse. So we've talked about how this, they kind of took this laissez-faire attitude. We're going to leave the economy alone. We're not going to have the government try to regulate it. Many others, however, disagreed. Uh, they believed that this sudden infusion of money into the economy would stimulate recovery. And the quickest way to increase the money supply was to resume the coinage of silver, especially if silver was valued at 16 to 1. The immediate effect of all of this cheap money would be to raise prices and thereby encourage businessmen to increase production. They would have to hire more people. So silver really seemed to be kind of a quick cure for the economic misery that a lot of Americans were experiencing at the time. And the demand for free silver increases after each time there's this kind of, you know, cycle of panic uh, and, and economic bust. Now, it's farmers who are particularly hard hit by this roller coaster economy. And so free silver is a very popular idea in rural America, especially.
In the late 19th century, we see that farm discontent is a worldwide phenomenon. Farmers are having trouble everywhere around the world. Um, and a lot of this had to do with uh, new means of transportation and communication. The farmers are now kind of caught up in this complex international market. Um, they don't have a lot of control over this market. They don't understand it. Farmers shared these grievances over the balance of economic power in the United States. So what were some of their grievances? Uh, farmers had become dependent upon, you know, sort of new technologies to survive. They had to purchase machinery. They had to, you know, sort of use fertilizer. They had to, you know, sort of use all these new technologies to survive. So they had to take out loans to compete in this new economy. And they're all linked in one way or another uh, to this larger economic world uh, in a number of ways, but especially through the railroads. Uh, the railroads are the thing that becomes the target of a lot of farmers' wrath during this era. Markets are being standardized at this time, and farmers figured if they could bet get that they could get better prices for their crops if they cooperated and eliminate the middleman, uh, the kind of you know people who were negotiating buying their crops, and they dealt directly with the buyers themselves. So railroads and market, markets were very essential for the farmers, but they also saw these institutions as oppressive, as exploitative. Uh, so farmers were complaining that, you know, they were being uh, they were being paid lower prices for their crops. Uh, they were having to deal with rising railroad rates. Railroads were charging exorbitant rates to ship your crop to market. People who hadn't worked to produce their crops were growing rich off of them. And many farmers saw this as fundamentally unfair. And they are hit particularly hard by this fluctuating economy in the 1880s and 1890s. So we see, you know, they're taking out loans on their farms. They are having to pay these onerous mortgages to the banks. Uh, and so there's this kind of general feeling of depression and resentment among farmers. Um, they realize, they start to realize that no one is going to help them except for themselves. The U.S. government at this point is not really going to bail them out. And so these are all factors that help make the rise of the populist movement possible. So farmers start to organize, and they first begin to organize themselves with a group called the Farmers Alliance. And the Farmers Alliance actually started out as two separate organizations. There was the National Farmers Alliance, which was centered around the Great Plains, and there was the Southern Farmers, Farmers Alliance, which began in Texas in 1875 and it expanded throughout the South. By 1890, uh, it claimed more than a million members. Uh, and they were a very well-oiled organization. They published a newspaper. They distributed their kind of, you know, alliance propaganda to hundreds of local newspapers. They sent lecturers out around rural America on this massive organizing drive to get people, you know, sort of on board. And they really wanted to establish cooperatives, farming cooperatives, designed to bring farmers together. And the, if they, they figured if they could pool their efforts, they would make greater profits. There was also a separate colored farmers alliance that enlisted black farmers at this time. The National Farmers Alliance was based uh, in the Great Plains. It was smaller. It formed a little bit later in, the 18, in 1880. Uh, in 1889, these two regional alliances merge into one big organization called the National Farmers Alliance and Industrial Union. And they go about sponsoring all kinds of so social and economic programs, but they also quickly turn to organizing politically. Uh, in the West, political leaders, uh, they, the leaders of the Farmers Alliance rejected both political parties. They said, you know, we don't, we don't want to align ourselves with either the Republicans or the Democrats. And so they start to organize their own parties. In the South, however, members of the National Alliance, they didn't agree with this strategy. They wanted to ally themselves with the existing Democratic Party. So you can see here in this drawing uh, where you have, you know, sort of the Northern Farmers Alliance and the Southern Farmers Alliance coming together. They are throwing all of their old animosity, again, this sort of, you know, idea of coming back together after the Civil War. They're throwing all of this into this pit and they are marching forward to the nation's capital together. Uh, so it's this idea of, you know, sort of the North and the South coming back together, reuniting and working together to, you know, further their cause. Now, it's important to remember that women were actually a really crucial part of the National Farmers Alliance and the populist movement. 
uh, women played a really important role in the alliance. And alliance women were part of a larger movement of social reform that is just beginning to get started throughout the country in the late 19th century. And this is a movement what historians call progressivism. And we'll be talking more about this later. One example of a very prominent woman in the alliance was a woman named Mary Elizabeth Lease. Uh, she was a lecturer, a writer, um, she was a political activist, and she worked for uh, the causes of both temperance, uh, she was you know, an anti-alcohol advocate, and also populism. Uh, she was from Kansas, and she was very active as a speaker and a writer for the alliance. Uh, she was very ardently against big business and monopolies. She said at one point, Wall Street owns the country. It is no longer a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but a government of Wall Street, by Wall Street, and for Wall Street. The great common people of this country are slaves, and monopoly is the master. And so her politics were pretty radical for the time. Uh, by 1890, her involvement in the populist movement, in the kind of growing uh, Farmers Alliance, uh, places her, you know, really at the forefront. And she gives speeches all over Kansas and also the West and the South, uh, promoting the cause of, of the Farmers Alliance. At least a quarter of Alliance members were nationwide were w women. Um, many were the wives and daughters of men who belonged to the Alliance as well. And women in the Alliance, uh, they were definitely considered to be subordinate uh, to the men, but, most, but women were very interested in reform, and they considered themselves to be uniquely suited to taking on the issues of the Alliance because they were affecting families. Uh, and so this idea of economic justice it was kind of coupled together with preserving family values. And so we see them kind of, you know, linking these two ideas together. Women's suffrage was also a very important cause for many Western uh, Alliance women. They believed that it was the prerequisite for the establishment of the kind of state that they wanted to see, the kind of, you know, regulatory cooperative commonwealth that they wanted to bring about. So uh, many women were very active in the populist movement and, and in uh, the Farmers Alliance in general. All right, so uh, how do we get from the Farmers Alliance, which is ostensibly just an economic organization, uh, to the establishment of a, an actual third political party? Uh, so after the 1890 elections, alliance leaders, they urged the idea that we're going to form a national third party to promote our ideas, to promote reform. Southerners in the Farmers Alliance were still kind of reluctant. They were still hoping that they could, you know, maybe capture control of the Democratic Party. Uh, but in July of 1892, they held a convention in Omaha, Nebraska, and they decided to form a new populist party. Uh, and eventually they brought the Southern Alliance leaders on board. Uh, they now were convinced that they shouldn't ally with the Democrats who were kind of using the alliance's popularity, but who were not really interested in implementing the reforms that the alliance was calling for. So the Southern Alliance splits from the Democrats and they join with the Northern Farmers Alliance to promote this idea of forming a third party. Uh, and in 1892, uh, the populist nominate a guy named James B. Weaver for president, um, and they waged a pretty active campaign uh, in that year. They won over a million votes. It was the fir first third party candidate to attract over a million votes, uh, and they ended up actually carrying four states uh, and portions of others, and they got a total of 22 electoral votes. Obviously, this was, you know, sort of pretty small, but it was a good start. Um, Populists were elected governors in Kansas and North Dakota, uh, 10 congressmen, uh, five senators, 1,500 members of state legislatures were populists uh, and elected during 1892. But despite these victories, the election was ultimately a little disappointing for the populists because the Southern Democrats ended up you know, using a lot of intimidation and voter fraud and manipulation to hold on to the South. They were interested in trying to keep the populace from winning. 
Uh, and so they lose the South to violence and intimidation by the Southern Democrats. And they also end up losing the urban areas as well. Populism didn't really have a lot of appeal in urban areas. They weren't able to kind of attract the factory workers uh, to join their party yet. The populist, whoops, the populist platform of 1892 is really a classic document of American reform. Uh, it talked about a nation that was being brought to the verge of moral, political, and material ruin by corruption and economic inequality. And the populists put forward a long list of proposals to restore democracy and to uh, bring about economic opportunity for everybody. They called for things like the direct election of U.S. senators. They called for the government control of the currency. They called for a graduated income tax, uh, a system of low-cost public financing to enable their farmers to market their crops. Uh, they called for the recognition of the right of workers to form labor unions. They called for the public ownership of railroads. So they had a pretty broad platform. Um, and you can read through the Populist Party platform this week. Uh, and as you're reading, it's a good idea to kind of think about these questions. What are the problems that populists see existing within American society? Why do they argue that it's necessary to form a third party? What's their vision for the relationship between the government and the people? What kind of a government do the populace want? So as you're reading this week, think about these questions. Now you can really see the geographic appeal of populism when you look at this map. So the map shows the areas where the populace had a heavy percent populist share of the presidential vote in 1892. And you can see they have an enormous heavy concentration in the Great Plains states. Uh, and also, you know, sort of it's kind of moderate in some of the other agricultural areas like the far west and the south. It's not at all popular in the northeast. Uh, and we can, you know, sort of think about, well, why did populism not have that much appeal in the northeast? Now, uh, what happens in 1892 is that, as you can see, this is the electoral map from 1892, uh, the, pot, the Democrats end up winning by a pretty large margin, 62 to 33 percent. The populists only get 5 percent of the vote, which is pretty good for, you know, a newly created third party. Uh, and, you know, sort of trying to break up this two-party system was a, was a really difficult prospect. So the Democrats win the election. Grover Cleveland becomes the president. And then the following year, after Cleveland is elected, the country in 1893 falls into a very deep economic depression. Uh, this was the worst in U.S. history until we get to the Great Depression in the 1930s. A quarter of the nation's railroads go bankrupt. Uh, in some cities, unemployment among industrial workers was greater than 25%. Uh, and so Americans respond to the Panic of 1893 in a lot of different ways. So how does the president respond? How does President Cleveland respond? Well, he ends up repealing the Congressional Act purchasing silver. He blames this for the panic. He says we've the nation's gold reserves have declined, and so we're going to get rid of this idea of purchasing silver. The Populist Party, of course, is demanding that they re-monetize re silver. Uh, so they say, you know, we don't want to contract the money supply uh, during this panic. We want to increase it. We want to reverse the kind of deflation that we're seeing. And silver really becomes the focus. The silver issue becomes the focus of the Populist Party. But it ends up really becoming, kind of becoming a surface issue. It doesn't really address the real problems with the system, but it seems like a great quick fix for the economic woes of the country. But because it becomes the focus of the party, it obscures a lot of the other important issues that the populace had traditionally focused on. Things like the, you know, sort of control of the railroads. Uh, things like, you know, sort of uh, more de democratic elections. All of these kind of other issues get kind of pushed to the side and they start to concentrate on this thing of, you know, re-monetarizing silver. What we see workers responding to the Depression uh, in a very interesting way. We see, we start to see industrial armies of the unemployed 
marching to Washington to demand help. And we start to see industrial workers challenging both their employers and the federal government. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that here. The workers' response to the Depression is that during the Depression, we see a lot of urban and industrial protests escalating. Uh, in the late spring and summer of 1894, you have these so-called industrial armies of the unemployed converging on Washington, D.C. to petition Congress for relief. And the biggest and most highly publicized group of these uh, unemployed workers uh, was led by a guy named Joseph Jacob Coxey. Now, Coxie had a really interesting solution to end the Depression. He called for a massive public works program to engage the unemployed in building roads throughout the country. Now, if this reminds you a little bit of what the United States did during the New Deal, uh, that is no coincidence. Uh, it's very similar to some of the programs that were going to be implemented in the 1930s under the New Deal. Coxie's ideas are kind of ahead of their time in a lot of ways. When they got to Washington, uh, Coxie was arrested. He attempts to speak on the steps of the Capitol, and they arrest him. Uh, these armies are broken up by uh, local police. Just a few days after, the Pullman Railroad strike breaks out. The Pullman Car Company uh, was kind of this notorious corporation at the time. They had developed a model town for the workers in their factory to live in. So all of the workers in their factory lived in this town that was controlled and set up by the corporation. But workers were not happy because they didn't like all of the social control that was involved in this. Their employer was basically dictating where they lived, where they bought their food. They had to buy food at the local company store, uh, which, you know, sort of meant that, you know, the company could charge whatever prices it wanted for, for goods. And they protested uh, the fact that the company was cutting wages, but not actually reducing their rents. So they were paying money to the company to live in the company town, but then the company was not paying them the, same, the wages enough to, you know, sort of actually live there. So Pullman workers uh, were led by the American Railway Union, and this was headed by a guy named Eugene V. Debs. Uh, Eugene V. Debs is going to, you know, come back again, uh, as we'll see. He becomes a very prominent uh, political organizer and socialist during the late 19th and early 20th century. So Debs declares a boycott of all trains containing Pullman cars. And to put down this strike, President Cleveland orders federal troops to go to Chicago, where the company was located. He breaks up the strike. Debs is arrested. Uh, and so we start to see this kind of attempt, at least in the state of Illinois, to forge an alliance between the farmers and the laborers in Illinois. But this is not particularly successful. Why are these incidents important? Well, it shows that there's this possibility during the depression of the 1890s for farmers and workers to come together in this kind of massive populist movement. But this never ends up materializing in any big way. And so it explains why we don't see a third party populist, uh, you know, populist party emerging. Uh, so by 1894, the Populist Party is already beginning to decline, uh, even though most people didn't really recognize this at the time. And part of this problem, part of the problem that the populists had in kind of getting themselves established as a third party is that they did not have a huge opportunity. They didn't have the kind of political opportunity structure uh, that would allow them to succeed. By the time of the populists, there was not a huge opportunity for these so-called third parties or minor parties to influence national policy by gaining a foothold in Congress. By the 1890s, Congress had basically institutionalized the two-party system because it granted powers to the leaders of congressional committees. The leaders of congressional committees are the ones who hold the reins of power in Congress. And so populist congressmen were often prevented from speaking. Uh, they didn't have the chance to introduce legislation or bills. So the, you know, sort of op the op options for the populace was, well, they could do one of two things. They could either fuse with one of the two major parties in hopes of gaining a majority. Or they could decide, well, we're going to go it alone. We're going to remain a third party and hope 
that things are going to get so bad that the major parties would be so resistant to change that people will start to turn to the populace for answers. And so this is kind of the classic dilemma of anybody who wants to try to establish a third party in a two-party system. How do you do this without either aligning yourselves with one of the two major parties or you know, just try to hope that people become so fed up with the two-party system that they turn to you? That ends up you know, kind of not really working out so well for the populace. So this brings us to the election of 1896. Um, and this is a really interesting election, presidential election. The election focuses primarily on the issue of gold versus silver. Um, and it's one of those elections that political commenter, commentators often refer to as realignments uh, because it really has far-reaching effects on the American political system as a whole. So as I mentioned, this idea of free coinage of silver was becoming increasingly popular, especially in the South and the West. Uh, the silver advocates believed that the amount of money in circulation was determining the health of the economy. If there's a money shortage, that meant that economic activity is going to be limited, and the ultimate result of this will be a depression. On the other hand, if the government were to coin silver as well as gold, that would mean more money in circulation, more economic activity, and prosperity. Farm prices would rise. Unemployment would fall. Silver was also this kind of symbolic issue with a lot of moral and patriotic dimensions. Uh, they argued, people who advocated for this idea of free silver argued that the U.S. could kind of, you know, switching to a silver standard, unlike most of the rest of the world, which was on a gold standard at the time, that the U.S. could kind of assert its independence um, from other countries at this point. And for many, it kind of becomes a symbolic issue. It starts to stand for a whole wide range of popular grievances. It represents the kind of struggle and the hopes of common people in America. It stands for rural as opposed to urban values. It represents, you know, that power shifting away from the Northeast and to the West and to the South. So in the election in 1896, the Republican Party nominates William McKinley for president, um, and they reject the idea of free coinage of silver. Um, they advocate, we're going we're gonna to go on the gold standard to you know, kind of restore prosperity. The Democratic Party had a much larger component of people who were in favor of this idea of free silver, particularly in the South and the West. Uh, even despite the opposition of President Cleveland at the time. So the power in the party was starting to shift to the South. Uh, the party's base was narrowing. Their, its outlook increasingly reflected Southern views. It was becoming a sectional, uh, no longer a national party at this point. A young lawyer and a former congressman, a guy named William Jennings Bryan, uh, he kind of emerges during the election. Uh, he was a very captivating public speaker, and he sees an opportunity to take on the role as leader of the pro-silver Democrats. So at the party's convention, Brian delivers this electrifying speech, um, and it becomes known as the Cross of Gold speech. And after he gives this speech, uh, he, you know, he's declared the party's candidate. He wins the nomination. Now, the populists are now in a very difficult position. Uh, they had chosen purposefully to delay their nominating convention until after the convention of the two major parties. They thought that both parties were going to nominate opponents of free silver, and then they could benefit by nominating a pro-silver candidate, and they could get all of that support. So what happens? Well, the Republicans, they predictably nominate William McKinley, who was anti-silver, but the Democrats didn't follow the script. They nominate William Jennings Bryan, who was at the time probably the country's leading free silver candidate. And not only is he, you know, pro-silver, but he's really dynamic. He's a great speaker and, you know, he's going to be kind of capture a lot of the imagination of the country. So the populists are surprised, and they're basically left in an untenable position. Uh, if they decide to fuse with the Democrats, they would no longer be an independent third party because they had put all of their eggs into the free silver basket. But if they don't fuse, no one will support them because why would people support the populists when the Democratic candidate also believes in free silver?
So the Populist Party basically falls apart at this point. Uh, they gather for their nominating convention. They choose to nominate William Jennings Bryan as their candidate for president, but it's a very contentious convention. There are fights literally breaking out. Um, Brian doesn't even acknowledge the nomination. Why would he? He was already nominated by one of the you know major political parties. Why is he going to acknowledge these you know sort of tiny little upstarts, the populace? So McKinley and Brian battle it out. It's a very close race. Uh, Brian ends up campaigning directly. Um, he's really the first presidential candidate to take his campaign directly to the voters in a very systematic way. He goes on a big speaking tour. He visits 27 states. Uh, he speaks a total of 600 times to as many as 3 million people. And he campaigns on this idea of restoring an older rural America, the values of the common people. He talks about economic opportunity for everyone. McKinley, on the other hand, he lets the voters come to him. He literally stands on the porch of his house in Canton, Ohio, and the people come by thousands to hear him speak. So he doesn't go traveling all around the country. Um, he uses the press uh, to reach as many people as Brian end up, ends up doing. And so he appeals to workers, he appeals to immigrants, he appeals to farmers, businessmen, the middle class. Uh, he defends kind of this urban industrial society. So we see this election kind of really playing out as this rural versus urban uh, election. On election day, voter turnout was very high. Um, and by that night, it was clear that McKinley had won. He crushes Brian in the cities. So basically, in the election of 1896, Americans kind of choose McKinley's urban industrializing nation over Bryan's rural agriculturally based nation. The Democrats are kind of portrayed as this party of crazy economic ideas, and so they start to go into a long decline. Um, in 1900, Congress adopts the gold standard, and the Populist Party and this great issue of free silver uh, fades into obscurity. Or did it? In 1900, a failed journalist and a traveling salesman named L. Frank Baum publishes a children's novel, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And this book becomes a huge bestseller. It receives a huge amount of critical acclaim. Baum goes on. He writes 13 more books uh, written uh, based on this magical land of Oz. And, of course, the story is adapted into this classic 1939 film, The Wizard of Oz, starring Judy Garland. And that's how most people know the story. But is The Wizard of Oz really more than just a kid's fairy tale? Some scholars have argued that The Wizard of Oz was actually written by L. Frank Baum as an allegory about populism and the politics of the 1890s. So if we look at the story, uh, we can kind of see some interesting metaphors uh, that Baum is using here, maybe. In the story, Dorothy is swept away from Kansas in a tornado, and she arrives in this mysterious land inhabited by the munchkins, or the little people. And her landing kills the Wicked Witch of the East, you might say the bankers and the capitalists, who kept the munchkin people in bondage. Now, in the movie, Dorothy begins her journey through the land of Oz wearing ruby slippers. But in the original story, Dorothy's magical slippers are silver. Obviously, a reference to free silver. Along the way, she's traveling on the yellow brick road, gold. Uh, she meets the Tin Woodman, who is rusted solid. This might be considered to be a reference to the Depression of 1893, when you have these industrial factories shutting down. The Tin Woodsman's real problem, though, is that he doesn't have a heart. Uh, and we can sort of see maybe this is the result of all this dehumanizing work that he's doing in the factory that's turning men into machines. Dorothy also meets the Scarecrow, who doesn't have a brain. The Scarecrow? Farmers. Uh, next, Dorothy meets the Cowardly Lion. He's an animal in need of courage. Lots of people have said, well, maybe this stands for William Jennings Bryan, who has a very loud roar. He's a great speaker, but he doesn't have much else to kind of back that up. So together, Dorothy and the Tin Woodman and the Scarecrow and the Cowardly Lion, they go off to the Emerald City, Washington, D.C., in search of what the wonderful Wizard of Oz, the president, might give them. <laughs> 
when they finally get to the Emerald City and they meet the wizard, he, like all good politicians, appears to be whatever people see, wish to see in them. Uh, he also ends up playing on their fears. But soon the wizard is revealed to be a fraud. He's a little old man with a wrinkled face who admits he's been making believe. He says, I'm just a common man. Uh, but he's a common man who can only rule by deceiving people into thinking that he's more than he really is. And the, the scarecrow says, you're a humbug. Um, and this is kind of really where we see the core of Baum's message. Uh, those forces that are keeping the farmer and the worker down, that they are being manipulated by frauds who are ruling by deception and trickery. The president is only powerful as long as he's able to manipulate and fool people. Finally, to save her friends, Dorothy melts the Wicked Witch of the West, uh, and she, the wizard flies off in a balloon uh, to you know, live a new life somewhere. The Scarecrow, the farmer, is left in charge of Oz, and the Tin Woodman is left to rule the East. So we've got you know, sort of the farmers in control of the West, the Tin Woodman in control of the East. This kind of populist dream of the farmer and the worker gaining political power never ends up coming true. And Baum seems to kind of recognize this because he sends the cowardly lion, William Jennings Bryan, back into the forest. And, you know, Bryan doesn't win the election. He retreats from national politics. Dorothy's able to return to her home with the aid of her magical silver shoes. But when she wakes up in Kansas, she realizes they've fallen off, representing the demise of the silver issue in American politics. So this is kind of an interesting idea. Uh, whether the Wizard of Oz is actually intended to be an allegory is open for debate, but I think it's kind of fun to speculate uh, what the true meaning of the story might be. All right, so this kind of brings us to asking the question, well, why does populism fail? Why does it never really kind of get off the ground? Well, partly it fails because its organizational base, the base of this movement, was limited to regions that could not carry a presidential election. They just don't simply have the population to carry an election. The West and the South are not as populated as the Northeast at this time, and they just don't have the, you know, kind of uh, amount of population to carry the presidential election. We've also talked about how the two-party system is becoming increasingly institutionalized at this point. It's very hard for a third party to kind of break in and gain any kind of traction or foothold in Congress at this point. Once the organizational network of the Farmers Alliance declines, there's really nothing that holds the big movement together. And populism also, populists also really face the problem of having to compromise their ideals in the face of political reality. As I mentioned, they, they had to face the issue of whether they're going to align themselves with the two major, with one of the two major parties or whether they're kind of going to go alone. And they end up having to kind of compromise some of their ideals. But despite populism's failure to take hold, most of the ideas that the populists are pushing at this point don't go away. Uh, they are dismissed as being too radical in 1896, but we're going to see these ideas resurface during the progressive era. The populists were, in many, many ways, kind of ahead of their time. All right, so that kind of brings us to the end of today's lecture, and I hope you guys have enjoyed it and, you know, learning about the populace and uh, learning about politics in the late 19th century. And uh, if you have any questions, please do post them in the general questions form, or you can email me. And I hope everybody has a great week.